should start a miner in your house, period, the end. Like every human being that loves Bitcoin should mine Bitcoin. Why? Well, number one, you're contributing to the network that you rely on. <laughs> so you're being uh -huh. a good citizen of the network. Uh, but number two, it teaches you things about the the architecture of Bitcoin versus the other coins that, in my op opinion, has proven to be invaluable through the years of, of looking through, uh, you know, what projects are doing what and how are they doing it. If you start with the fundamental knowledge of how Bitcoin is created, then you can see the weaknesses and the flaws of the centralized models much more clearly. That would be my premise. Okay, so when you started mining, what year was it? What was the your very first miner? 2013. 2013. So did you buy one miner? Did you plug I, it into your house? I just started house? mining on my computer. I, I, ah. I heard that this opportunity existed. A friend of mine um, from my football team, I played football at the University of Texas, had called me and said, hey, there's this new Bitcoin thing and you should get into it and he knew that i loved technology and loved math and loved finance and so i went over to his house and i saw what he was doing and it was a game it seemed at that point in time the most tangible example of planting a money tree that mm -hmm. you that i had ever seen and so this it awakened a lot of uh, inspired thoughts about how i could scale this and and what the pinch points were to the scalability and what were the catastrophic risks that needed to be avoided as you scaled. And uh, because, you know, it, it, at its simplest form, it's if you plug the machine in and you, you should be making money, essentially. The, and, yeah. and historically, how much, you how much money were you making? So you plug this in and, and you, your, your PC was starting to mine and, and you had one PC, presumably, when you started. And you I were did. mining on that one PC. I did. Yeah. <clears throat> how so, much? How much Bitcoin were you mining? Uh, uh, let's just say a month on that. Well, it wasn't. I wasn't measuring it like that. I was in the second epoch, so it was a twenty-five, you know, Bitcoin reward. I was in right. a lot of different mining pools, but what I was really focused on was trying to get miners out into the world in a useful form other than just mining Bitcoin. So let me give you an example of that. Okay. I can in, go into the basement of a, a large building and mm -hmm. I can set up a whole host of miners and those miners can do two things. They can produce Bitcoin. They can also produce a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. So if I put a damper control system on that building's air intake, that when the thermostat reaches a lower point than the set point you set the certain thermostat mm -hmm. at 72 and it's right. at 69 well then that damper opens and it funnels all that hot air into the building instead of ex you know exhausting it out of the building right I, I was intrigued with the the force multiplier that this new network had on the real world and the electrical consumption the heating savings that could be achieved how you found flare off energy, for example, or, or excess energy um, that wasn't being properly used and or stored. And how do you tap into that? It was really more of the educational aspects of how does this grow and, and where does it fail? And so, okay, I was, so you were start, you started out with the idea of I'm going to mine some Bitcoin. Yeah. I'm going to start with different kind of, uh, but let's just go back to the point. You, you had one PC, right? Mm -hmm. And your very first mining. And you were, were you finding blocks on your own just without being in a pool at um, that point? I, I never found any blocks on my own until later, until okay. um, I was on the ASIC uh, machines. And the okay. ASIC machines changed everything, obviously. Um, okay, so let's just start. We're going back to the, <laughs> going back to 2013. You're, 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 you're signing up with a pool. Which pool were you signing up with? Or I can't pools. even remember, to be honest with you, back then. Okay. It, it's two, a lifetime ago. I got four kids. Okay, right, I can yeah. barely remember what happened yesterday. Okay. So you were getting, you were getting some money. Yeah, <laughs> I was getting money. And, um, uh, and then, I went, then you started scaling this, you know, this thing. You're, you know, one, on one PC, you weren't making that much money. You were making no, some money. No, you weren't. Money. It was more, like I said, that was just to learn about it. That was to understand it and kind of master right. it. 
Um, and then when I started taking it more seriously, um, ASICs had just come out. And what year was so that's twenty fourteen now? Yeah, twenty four. But I didn't really get into it until twenty fifteen. Um, there, okay. That was one of the um, the turnoffs, to be honest with you, about getting um, you know transitioning from computer mining into ASICs was the pitch point and the pinch point and the control that Bitmain had on the market. I mean, I think at that point they had 75, 80% of the production. Um, right. I still know that the top three manufacturers have over 95% of the production. And I learned a very valuable lesson during that cycle. Uh, mm -hmm. the lesson was that buying miners, they're always, priced according to the production value right so when the halving happens <laughs> your production value cut is cut in half so therefore your your equipment value is cut in half and okay so, so let's got, look at let's look at this this sheet here okay and we're going to kind of map your journey right so in 2013 can you see the you can see the yeah, screen yeah, right I can see the screen. so in 2013 we were at kind of a hundred a hundred kind of dollars per bitcoin right here right yeah hundred to two hundred and then it kind of hit about 200. This is when I bought my first Bitcoin right here, September of 2013. Okay. Um, I bought it on Mount Gox. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and so you were mining kind of in this period, right? About like a hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we kind of come in here. We have the, 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 all the way rise up to 1100. Then we have this collapse. <laughs> Very painful. Very Remember painful. It. At that point, very painful. I, I, okay, it was still At, just one computer, so it wasn't painful right. for me. But yeah, you know, it was for right. Them. And then now in 2015, this is as this is really the rise of ASICs, right? This this period, right? Yep. So at this point, you're now starting to you you feel like you understand the algorithm. You, you're kind of you're you're increasing on your miners, and at this point, you're you have different ASICs all over the place, correct? You're already starting to do this to, correct. to scale up? I, correct. I would help um, individuals set up their own ASIC farms. I would set up uh, my own ASIC farms. I was doing a lot. I was very passionate about ensuring energy savings as a financial right. mechanism that allows people right. to um, borrow against that equipment. And I was... I had a captive insurance policy that I had written to for that purpose. And okay. I was doing a lot of research to try to uh, guarantee through a financial insurance mechanism, the heating production value of the ant miner so okay. that you could subsidize the hard costs or the equipment costs going into large scale mining operations, which was okay. what I was really focused on. So how many miners, let's just say by the end of 2015, how many miners did you have at, at this point? Bitcoin still got 368. Uh, how many miners did you have roughly? Very few, probably three or four. I was still okay. in my kind of testing phases. Okay. So now, and by the way, let, let, it's interesting to look at this because a lot of people think Bitcoin just went straight up, but, but you know, 1100. 300 okay <laughs> so i remember this area very well right and i remember thinking bitcoin is dead okay and uh, and my friend I'm, I'm friends with a guy brock pierce and i remember him meeting me somewhere around here and and we were just sitting there and he and i said so still interested in bitcoin he, come on that thing did not work out very well for you and he's like yeah, I'm sort of still interested, but he goes, it's probably a better short than a long right here. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I remember that conversation. You know what I mean? Well, I would call the, the time between 2015 and 2018 the holy grail mining time. If you were an okay. individual that had money and you went yeah. all in during that time period, it was almost a can't lose situation. Um they were, I, so, I had lots of friends that did that as well, and it's it so in this period. Well. So like, let's say twenty fifth, late twenty fifteen to twenty. Well, let's just go through this period because I think it's worth walking. So now you're we're in twenty sixteen, right? And how many miners do you have now? 
kind of going into 2016? Like, in, like I said, tw- I didn't I didn't start to ramp up until 2017. I was okay, still so doing. I, I was okay. more in my educational journey until then. Right. Okay. So now now we get to 2017, and I remember really well when we hit a thousand. Right. That was like wow. I do too. Okay. We're, yeah. We are back. Right. Because remember, this was 2013. And now we have to wait all the way up to 2017. So four years later, and finally we're back to Mount Gox levels, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what did that, when you saw that we were back, what was the feeling? What was your feeling there? The feeling was I didn't waste all my time. I was really happy at that point that all of the time that I had spent educating myself and learning about this system was actually worth something and i was going to be able to carry that knowledge into the future like you i also had Mm -hmm. doubts along the way that we were going to survive and that it was gonna that it's going to actually work we were going to get to critical mass it's interesting that it took three years right between that and that right Mm -hmm. and then really if you look here right from here to there about three years as well as well right yep from you know and from here to hear about three years, right? You know, from there to there. Like, we're just kind of, we just broke through the old highs, right? So I I would tell you that I think you had a premise that you spoke about um, recently that's really caught some momentum as it relates to does the having really matter? Yeah. Um, I would argue that the correlation is more tied to the equipment's life cycle (laughs) Okay. Miners' right. life cycle than the actual having. There are significant things that are byproducts of the having that right. affect the mining community in such right. a way that causes massive shifts in economics, right? You start moving massive amounts of money around because, in order for you to stay up with your previous production, you've got to double your hash rate. <laughs> right. So that's a huge capital outlay. In so when were those there. when were those mining kind of technology improvements? What what were the the kind of the dates? You sort of said those dates were really important, right? When the so, S nine mining miner came out, it changed the world. Um, okay, it was. And what, such when a, was the S nine? When did the S nine come out? I want to say 2016, if I remember. Okay. I, I didn't get mine. They came out in 16. But no one could get them. <laughs> okay. Bitmain was hoarding them for themselves. And okay. in my opinion, I don't have uh, any uh, evidence other than anecdotal evidence. But when I would order brand new machines and I would get mm-hmm. those S9 miners in, I would open them up and they, the fans would be covered in dust. Mm. So, so they were you. I, they were used. Well, they were used for a certain period of time. Now, they, I contacted them and they said, well, that's research and development. That's like testing for, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, to make sure that the units are working properly. But it looked like significant use to me because I was used to opening up these miners and cleaning them because they get dirty and you, you, you have to clean them. And so right. I opened up the brand new units to see what what the, you know, what all the rage was about in terms of these S nine miners. And I found out uh, the rage was uh, a huge improvement in hash rate. I mean, you went from, you basically six X or four X your hash rate right out of the gates. Okay. So before the, the S nine, what was the, the previous version uh, of mine? I want to say the the S seven. Um, that was back when I only had one or two. The S nines were really where I started to. And what was the what was the Terra hash of the the S nines? Right around fifteen. Okay, and the S sevens. You want to say it's? We're gonna say about. I want to say three or four. Yeah. Okay, so we went from three or four Terra hash to fifteen Terra hash, kind of overnight, right? So like, we had this kind of new product that you you couldn't get a hold of, right? Correct. And some people had it, and their costs were like one fourth the other guys, right? Well, it but, wasn't their cost, so their cost actually went up because they consumed more electricity. Sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. But okay. their production no, value not. was four x, so it didn't matter no, what your right. costs were. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Um, okay, so then this is so. When did you get your hands on the S <laughs> nine? 
2017. Okay, so 2017. And you kind of went bananas right right around then, right? Well, I was really excited. I, I thought, man, this this is um, the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, I wanted as many as I could get my hands on. I was calling as, as many people as I could. Um, but it was kind of short-lived. Uh, let me explain why. Okay, yeah. Uh, Bitmain has mastered the art of using... The, let's talk let's back up and talk about what an asic is right let's talk uh, about it yeah yeah um it's an application specific specific integrated circuit okay okay and that's a fancy way of saying it does nothing but one thing <laughs> it guesses random numbers against the shea 256 code that's what it does mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there's a difficulty level and depending upon where that is, it's it's going to take so many random guesses before one of the miners hits the lottery number. And that miner's ledger or what its proposed ledger changes would be are yeah. the block that then gets voted on by all the rest of the mining community. And as soon as that block is 51 percent, boom, it's locked in as a permanent block on the Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, that's. That's how functionally, you know, the technology works. Right. When you go from a CPU to a G, uh, to an ASIC, you're you're moving up m uh, orders of magnitude. You're or moving up massive amounts of computing power because CPUs, computers, were designed to do a whole lot of things, not mm -hmm. just guess numbers. So when you redesign right. them to only guess numbers they mm -hmm. become infinitely more power than the other version, okay? Right. So you well, have these... Let's not, let's not say infinite. Well, yeah, not infinite. Yeah, you're a math guy. So a lot <laughs> exponentially more powerful or, or okay. what, yeah. whatever the proper term would be for that. Okay, but a, okay. Lot more okay. a lot more yeah. powerful. Yeah. So when they have this production that they've got in their possession and they're mining mm -hmm. it at their own facility, when mm -hmm. the halving comes around, the the price of those miners drops in half, literally. And so mm -hmm. what what they're trying to do is to hold their inventory until the right timing to dump on the market right before mm -hmm. the halving so that they can get rid of the last version at as high a price as they can. And mm -hmm. then a lot of people get stuck with a, a miner that they thought was going to continue to produce the way that um, everyone had talked about it producing, but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't anymore. And so, right. you know, people don't factor that into their, their, their formula and a lot of them go bust. And that's why I think, in my opinion, we've seen this huge consolidation. Uh, well, so let's talk about that relative to the mining side, the halving cycle, because I think, uh, and I, I wrote this down the other day, but I think it was June of 2016 was the halving, right? May or June, I can't remember, but it was June of 2016. So we had this halving, right? Yep. The rewards drop, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, but the S16 is coming out right before the happening, right? The, yeah, the S9. Uh, the, sorry, the S9. The S9 yeah, is coming, coming out in. right before because they had been using it for the previous year I to see. mine in the most rich epoch that they right. could, right? They have access to an epoch that's producing 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. Right. Well, I, I have consolidation of power in the fact that I own 75% of the market share of the ASIC mining um, mm -hmm. technology. Well, I, it's best used in inside of my own four walls. Like if I'm them, I'm right. mining and then I'm selling used equipment or selling, you know, equipment that's not as profitable as it once was to right. everyone else at that point. And that's, you know, the concentration risk that we have in the mining space is, in my opinion, the 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 hardest thing to look at from a beauty perspective in the Bitcoin community. It, it's, it's pretty ugly. I mean, it's, it's manufacturing of technology and plugging it into, you know, in the wall and managing that technology. It's, it's not mining is, is an appropriate term. <laughs> it's, it's like mining gold. You're down in the right. bowels of the earth trying to, well, it's similar in that gold miners tend to be pretty giant companies like Newmont mining and, Barrack gold and the difference you know, would be you don't you don't find a lot of guys like that movie Matthew Matthew McConaughey you know gold yeah there's not a lot of these independent guys there are a few of them but like gold is really run by 
giant companies right now, you know? Well, because, and, and this would be my argument for why mining um, right now and the power that the miners possess is less important than it ever has been uh, because right. they control less of the market. Um, the, the hash rate, I believe will start to come down. I don't think we're going to exponentially go up this curve um, from a hash rate perspective because okay. it, it becomes um, unsustainable, in my opinion. I, I personally believe that we will go towards a uh, mining model in the future at some point whereby which everyone that's involved in the network is mining and using the heat production of the miner for some benefit and it's it's as decentralized as we could ever hope i mean my hope would be that every human being that participates in bitcoin has a miner in their home and i actually went to great lengths to design this my first idea oh, really? around okay. this was to create a little box like a, a trunk and have two or three asics in it and mm -hmm. have it on wheels and have hotels roll them into unoccupied rooms and plug them in for the night you know, I've seen, uh, Tillman, I've seen uh, a couple of these. I, I don't know, if you, do you ever go to these Pacific Bitcoins? Uh, I don't. Swan. Swan. <laughs> Anyways, they they probably have them at other things like Bitcoin Miami. Uh, but I've seen some of these kind of Porto miner, you know, heat, heat, heater miner type things. They're pretty cool, you know, like just kind of put them in your house. They kind of, they kind of, if you're living in a place like Colorado, you know, it's it's, it's a little better Los Angeles, you do not want heat. No, you don't, you, you don't need that in Los Angeles for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, but, so that's really interesting. So, okay, so let's go back to the chronology now. Now we're in 2017, okay? Now, 2017, everybody will remember is that was the, the, you know, the mother of all bull runs, right? Yeah. We started the year at 1,000. We ended the year at 20,000. Just absolutely insane. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, from my perspective, it wasn't driven so much by Bitcoin. You know, like I remember very well the narrative of 2017 was Ethereum, right? And it was ICOs, you know, that everybody was doing an ICO. I was not in really in crypto at the time, but everybody around me was doing an ICO. Yep. And, um, and the only thing everybody was talking about was Ethereum, right? And sort of Bitcoin was kind of going up sort of in, in kind of in, in sympathy, you know, and it, it, it reminded me a little bit of kind of the Internet. And I remember like people were still buying AOL, even though like the action was the Internet, you know, yeah. but they were like, well, AOL is part of the Internet. And if, if, if Bitcoin felt very old back then, you know, like a lot of people were like, OK, you don't want to be involved in Bitcoin. You want to be involved in this new thing, Ethereum. Well, I th but look at what's happened since then is we've mm -hmm. all learned our lesson as we've seen every other protocol fail at some point. Oh, and, I, you, and I mean, every yeah. single one. So Bitcoin hasn't. And, and the time that it, we have experienced Bitcoin and what it's done and what it's accomplished as. No, a network, I, I'm with you. A hundred percent. I mean, it's, there's nothing that even comes close to it in the course of human history. Honestly. No, I look, I, I'm agreeing the only point I would like to make is that from a narrative perspective, I, I, I do not even remember. To, I know from a mining perspective, having made it the entire difference in 2016, right? Everybody's got, wait a second. My mining rewards went down. I need to get these, these, these S nine, a six, how do I get them? My life is about to end, et cetera, right? And then, but from a, a non-minor perspective, right? From a non-minor perspective, nobody really, I remember 2016, people were saying this happening thing's it's useless. It didn't do it. I re literally remember reading about Mike Hurd and like, like, this is not important. Bitcoin's not even going anywhere. The mining stuff's dead. Uh, the happening is, is dead. And then everybody started talking about Ethereum. Like literally, that was that was my recollection of it. And then there was, of course, the the block size wars, right? And then everybody was like, "Well, Bitcoin's not even going to survive. It's going to be some very smart people that I know were telling me that Bitcoin Cash was going to become the main." <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, the fork. That was that was you pick your side. It was the, 
Everything, <laughs> and then everybody was like worried about, um, you know, the basically we couldn't trust Bitcoin because we didn't know which Bitcoin, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, then, I didn't fall for the Bitcoin Cash because uh, okay, the ant miners were you know, they were heavily involved with that. I'll just say that. Uh, oh right, yeah, yeah, right, exactly because the ant. That's kind of when Jihan Wu and uh, and Roger Ver and Craig Wright, right after that's kind of when they made their move, right? Yep. And then they, they had that sort of conference together, the three of them, and they were like, yep. uh, I don't know. That was well, that. So now we go 2017. I would say whether you were mining, whether you just happened to own Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. This was this was the mother of all bull markets and the mother of all crashes, right? I feel. I agree. And I so agree. so you were you were ramping up like crazy in 2017, right? Yep. And you were buying just miners hand over fist is basically my understanding. As, as many as you could get into the country. I mean, you at that point you were literally having to buy single units on eBay. Okay. Um, and or put an order in with Bitmain and wait a, an untold number of months. Like they would, you'd put an order in and you'd pay with Bitcoin and or Bitcoin Cash. Excuse me. They and then it's like Bitcoin you Cash. just pray that they just decide. You to just pray and you just yeah, you wait for as long as it takes to get them. And you know, but but the problem with that is is that you can't predict the financial um, outcome. You, if you don't yeah. know when the time starts, right? Because yeah. there's so many right. things that go hand in hand with that time cycle uh, as it relates to, what, relates to whether you're profitable or not. And so they, they, yeah. get, they got everybody their expensive equipment mm -hmm. right before the crash <laughs> and right before the halving and right as okay. the halving happened. So your orders, if you think about if you had an order with Bitmain in and you got it in 2017 like I did, you put it in in 2016 – when, when, you know, everything was looking rosy and you had no right. uh, thunderclouds on the horizon. And then when the rug gets pulled out from under you from a pricing perspective and from a delivery, delivery perspective, it, it, it blows your whole model up. Now, if you're realized, looking at, if you, if you're looking at a model, uh, Tillman, that, that like 2017, where things are going up 20 X, uh, I imagine that once you get delivery of a machine, Right, you're probably in, you've probably made back your original investment uh, within a couple months, right? Is that if about you right? Timed it right, yeah. If you timed it right, you were out in three months with profits, and if you timed mm -hmm. it wrong, you were stuck for five years. And that was the that is literally the spectrum of success. Um, and yeah. by the way, the equipment doesn't last for five years, so right. You better sell the equipment is the point at its highest. You wait until Bitcoin price goes up to a certain point so that the relative value of the equipment is at its highest level. And then you get rid of all your old equipment, make a new capital purchase of new equipment so that you can stay up with the hash rate that's needed to produce what you're, you, you're trying to if produce. If you had to guess, like kind of not only through that period, like what's the entire, uh, what's your sort of time frame for like you, you you're a miner you come in you got some money let's say you have a million dollars right uh what what is your do you look at this thing on a two-year basis a three-year basis what what's your in and out you know what do you look at it i don't think you can play the game with a million dollars these days effectively right okay i'm just, you, I'm just if, using that yeah i think the game has gotten so big that what you have to be able to do is go in with a hundred million, put twenty five okay. million in equipment, and keep mm -hmm. seventy five million in reserves, and then essentially hold your Bitcoin. Never sell it based upon paying the bills. You just okay. produce it, and then you time your exits on, uh, mm -hmm. on a completely different schedule. It has nothing to do with you know life of li life cycle of the miner or anything else, because that's where I would argue that the vast majority of people that have gotten into mining have has subsidized the market. They've lost money on the miners. They've lost money on the production versus the, you know, the, the cost. Um, and so I don't think that's a bad thing. I think there should be a cost to pr 
per, to participate in a network. And that's why I think mm -hmm. everyone should participate in the network and bear that burden at an incremental level. But now we're seeing this consolidation and this over consolidation to the point where I think things will materially change. I think we're going to see this consolidation start to dissipate and you're going to see a, a much broader uh, mining community because the money's out of it at that point. Mm -hmm. Now it's about security. So if I'm BlackRock, <laughs> it's in my best interest to have a secure network. And right. a secure network, it, the most secure a network can be is the, as decentralized as it can get. Those are correlated one-to-one. -one. So right, if, right. I can, if I can get mining capacity put into microwaves, refrigerators, any electrical piece of equipment that sits in a home that has a mm -hmm. steady supply of electricity, I can have that turn on and contribute in a way that is nothing to that consumer. But if mm -hmm. you did it across scale, if every mm -hmm. human being on earth had a miner built into their refrigerator and it had this much capacity, just nothing, it was nothing, you, less than one pair ash. Right. It's, it's much better than having what we have now, which is millions and millions of terabytes. You know, this, I've, I've had, a, I call it a show. I don't not really have a show. I mean, look, I'm just, a, I'm just a guy with a microphone. Literally, my I'm a guy with a microphone and a webcam, right? But I've had a, a Bob Burnett of Barefoot Mining on, and he made the exact same point, right? So his point is, look, if the entire mining hash rate is uh, run by, let's call it three or four, major public miners <laughs> and the government for, for let's say the government comes in and, and with guns and says that no, we're shutting this thing down. Right. It, it basically could cause, there's a scenario where it could cause a difficulty adjustment. It would. If they do it all at once, that it could cause a difficulty adjustment such that there is no Bitcoin produced for a year. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 but, the, the, but the, the, I'm not even Bitcoin, the, the, the entire, you know, the, we, we do not actually, uh, tran all, all transactions are frozen for a year. Well, they're just backlogged. Um, you know, yeah, they're, they're backlogged, just, right? They're yeah. just backlogged. Right? It's yeah, possible. I, I can't right? remember the website offhand and I'll, I'll, I'll try to find it and send it to you so you can link it for the, the viewers. But there was a website back in the day that I used to follow all the time. And it was a cool little graphic and it was people trying to get on bus school buses Mm -hmm. And each block had a certain number of seats. And it was just a visual representation of blocks getting processed and transactions right. going through and how long the line was in certain networks versus other networks. And, it, you know, we've seen I, I've had transactions take over a day and a half to settle before. Um, and, and but that's the beauty of Bitcoin is the math regulates everything. And eventually, right. like you said, it will return to its mean. You're just talking about a massive swing or an anomaly off the mean, and it will come back. Uh, that's that's the nature of it. But it may take a lot of time. And I do think that that day is coming. I don't know how drastic that day will come. I, it could happen in one day, or we could be very intelligent about this and mitigate the risk by putting miners in in equipment that p consumers are already buying. Right. Like, you know, that, right. that would be the, the answer to this. That's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, so if you had to guess, uh, so I, I loved your comment that basically the miners net net have kind of subsidized the, the network. Yeah. If you had to guess, like if, if, and I'm not saying just you yourself because you kind of, my understanding is you got a little bit of a flywheel going there and you were able to kind of build a pretty significant, mining thing without bringing in like public capital or anything like that. Right. Well, we were early. It was just interest. I mean, it was the, the right. equipment was so compound interest, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was very inexpensive. You weren't paying $5,000 for an ASIC back then. You know, how much you, was it? Two, $300. I mean, it was nothing. Oh, I see. Yeah, and you, right. could, you could stack them. Um, but right. that, that to me, it's, a lot of people talk about the concentration risk as it pertains to the mining capacity. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the concentration risk as it pertains to the manufacturing capacity. Mm -hmm. that, that to me is much more significant because mm -hmm. 
when a manufa- when you take Bitmain and the top three producers and you say they produce 95% of the ASICs that exist on the earth, right. we don't get to see what the next generation is capable of. But we do know it's going to be a lot more than it is today. And, and where, are the, where, where are those miners produced? What, where are those plants that produce those all miners? All three of them in China. Now, wouldn't you say that's a pretty big risk? That's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, that, that's, the, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a massive risk because they get to see what the hash rate is of the next iteration before mm-hmm. anyone. And they get to do a value case analysis. Is it better for us to sell these or is it better for us to use these? And in the past, it's been better for them to use them. (laughs) Going forward, I don't know. And and I don't know how much that changes their manufacturing model and their business model. But that's how they played it in the past. And we're about to find out with this having whether they play it the same way in the future. Okay, so now we know that Taiwan has the market, you know. Pretty much we're all dependent on Taiwan for our kind of AI semiconductor chips, right? Like if Taiwan gets invaded, we're screwed. The market AI is is over. Like we're 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 done for the next, I don't know, twenty years. I've heard years, it's a twenty year setback, yeah. Yeah, twenty year setback, right? So and kind of with respect to Bitcoin, I don't know how much of a lead they these Chinese have over other people. Uh, but it, it sounds they like they have be such a lead. Well, let me put it in perspective. Um, no one's even if you just rank the most productive miners mm-hmm. based upon their hash rate and their energy consumption, right? You can still uh, S nines didn't become um, uh, they they stopped becoming profitable in two thousand twenty two. Okay. Okay. So their run was from 2016 to 2022. They had a, a positive profit factor. 2022, S9s became obsolete. You know, they're worthless. They're paperweights. You know, I mean, unless they're used as a subsidized security method to, to a more robust network. But it's not to make money, right? Well, Andrew, look, I, I'm going to ask you a question about these public companies, right? Like marathon uh, let's just focus on two of them right which are i've looked at a little bit i don't own either one but marathon and riot right if you look at kind of their financials and these companies have just lost an ungodly amount of money i mean it's it's it's, it's like they're kind of cash furnaces right mm-hmm. and um and we're now moving into there's only there's only a three and a half percent of all Bitcoin that's left to be mined, right? So it just seems like it's going to be the Hunger Games, uh, and I just don't. Why do you? Why would anybody want to invest in those companies versus just buying Bitcoin? I, I don't. I'd like you to exp- give me an argument for why would I invest in Marathon or Riot? In my opinion, I, this is yeah. not financial advice, but no, I'm not financial. Yeah. Okay, I, you I, again, my premise is in 2017. Getting into the mining space for any normal person is mm-hmm. just participation effort. It's it's nothing more than that. You you're not yeah. going to make money. Um, you're just not that yeah. equip. Uh, I, I, my dad I, used I to did, tell me this. I did a tiny bit myself in 2020, but I I just went through Compass right, and I had my experience <laughs> was so bad. I'm not I'm not trying to bash Compass or anything, but like my my experience was. I signed up, and a year later, I got my miner was activated. So it was sort of the virtual version of what you were talking about. Yep. And I was I was all excited, and finally it comes online, and uh, and I was like, oh, finally I get this thing right. But I bought it when uh, the hash rate was eighty, right? Or was, <laughs> I think it was like eighty, right? And it was just right after the Chinese, uh, you know, banned Bitcoin. And then, uh, of course, my delivery was, you know, once I get the thing delivered, it was already going way up again. And and I only made, uh, in Bitcoin terms, about, you know, half the Bitcoin that I put but in, you, I got out. You uh, subsidized the effort. And so did I. And so did everybody else that participated at that yeah. level. And so, you know, it's it reminds me of a saying that my dad used to tell me, uh, you know, in my 20s, 
I was very hungry to find the next big deal. My dad and my family come from Texas. They're oil and gas people. And so I would bring oil and gas deals to my dad. And I lived in Tennessee at the time. And I'd go, hey, will you take a look at this? And he mm -hmm. wouldn't even look at it and go, yeah, it's not worth doing. And I'd go, well, how do you know you haven't looked at it? And he goes, because it's made it out of Texas. I'm sorry, what did he say? He, he said, because it's made it out of Texas. Okay. There's a lot of people that have first dibs on all oil and gas deals before it ever leaves Texas. So if they all right. rejected the deal, there's hair on it that you don't know about, or there's something right. about it. And so I would say the same thing that exists with the mining industry is if you find yourself feeling real lucky that you've got allocation into this really prized hardware that's bleeding edge technology that's going to produce a lot for you, in mm -hmm. my opinion it made it out of China. Right. It, it did. It, you're, you're not getting the deal you thought because they won't give you that deal right. <laughs> by definition. Right. They're not going to give you hmm. money that they could make themselves. So if I'm, if you don't, if you don't know who the sucker is at the table, you're looking at the sucker bingo in the mirror. Bingo. And so if, if I'm Bitmain, right. And I'm right. doing the research and development, I'm doing something no other company has ever done. I'm on okay. the bleeding edge. Why would I sell Fred a miner that makes him profit that I, without shipping it, without doing anything, I can just plug it into my warehouse that I have my manufacturing facility and mm -hmm. I can mine those efforts and I can make the money that Fred would have purchased that mining equipment to make. So the question is, is when they choose to sell it to you, in their minds, they're selling it to you at a higher price than the production value is worth. That is the very nature. And so when you're a big miner and you have last generation technology and the halving happens, you're dead. You're dead mm -hmm. in the water. You don't have the ability to survive. It's an extinction event unless you put more capital into new equipment, right? And so, you know, depending upon how deep your pockets are, depending upon how much cash you have in reserves, that's the nature of the beast. That's the name of the game at this point. And that's why I would argue that you have to, as a mining company, have more cash on hand than, than you even think you need to have because you don't even know what's coming down the pike from a technology perspective. And you don't know what the price is going to be. And you don't know when the availability is going to be and what the price will be at that point of availabil availability. And it's Man, not like, uh, like new To me, mining. this... Yeah, yeah. Right. No, to me, this is just, it's sort of the exact opposite of just holding Bitcoin, right? I agree. If you hold Bitcoin, all you do is you just sit back, you go skiing in Aspen, you know, you kind of <laughs> get on Twitter, you shoot the shit, um, you know, you watch it go, it doesn't go up all the time. You, you go through bear markets, but, you know, at the end of the day, your value proposition is pretty simple, right? And, and Michael Saylor proved this, right? Just like. I own a lot of Bitcoin. That's that's my best idea. I just I don't do anything with it. It's in so cold storage. Well, it, it's the, the mining right. thing. It takes, no, this. it takes no work, and mining takes a tremendous amount of work. And right, uh, I would say, imagine the gold market, right? Imagine mm -hmm. if Newmont Mining, every time they went to buy a new excavator, the price of the excavator swung six hundred percent, based upon the price of gold. Great analogy. You, you can't, that's not sustainable. No, so Newmont Mining, if that was the case, what would they do? They would wait until the price of gold was very, very low. They'd load up on equipment. They'd use it as much as they could to produce. They'd hoard that gold. They'd wait until the gold price increased. They'd start selling that gold to buy new equipment because they, if they don't, they can't keep up with production. So, you know, that's the one thing about um, Bitcoin mining that I, I do believe I, for, for, for everybody listening, don't let them hear me hear me as a pessimist here. Yeah. Being 90 plus percent through the curve makes yeah. this uh, a lot less important that, than it was in 2016. I'll say that. Um, I'm going to pull up Newmont mining. <laughs> do you see it on the, the screen? Uh, I do. Okay. So this is a stock. This is, you know, uh, I think it is the largest gold stock, gold miner, right? And it has, uh, you know, it. If you if you remember, gold did a gold did an ETF in two thousand 
in, in 2004, right? Yep. And the first gold ETF. And gold was $400 an ounce, okay? So gold has gone from $400 an ounce to $2,100 an ounce, okay? So it's it's gone up, let's guys say, somewhere between 5 and 6x, right? But look at Newmont. It's actually lower now than it was in 2004, right? Because so equipment same, costs and production costs have increased right along at a higher rate than gold. Increase. Right. And in yeah. fact, it's such a dog that it's actually the same as it was in 1996. Right. Like, you know, go. It, it's amazing how easy it is to screw up in the uh, in the mining space on gold. You know what I mean? Well, I, on Bitcoin, too, to be honest with you, it's it's yeah. even easier to screw up because the price of equipment in the mining space doesn't it isn't correlated to the price of gold. Okay. You have static fixed costs as it relates to sunk cost equipment that you need to buy at the beginning of your mining effort. When you go into the Bitcoin space, those three producers determine the price of an ASIC miner. So they're determining together in collusion what the price of that equipment is. I mean, that, that's, that's uh, something that has to change. And again, I would argue that this fierce race to try to find the equipment that unlocks the most hash rate per second, which now we're up to a hundred plus mm -hmm. hash rate. Per, that race is all but dead in my opinion. Okay. Um, unless Bitcoin goes up to insanely high prices, we should right. see hash rate come down. And what, what would you, what would you think an insanely high price would be for Bitcoin? Let's just talk numbers here. I think a million dollars a coin okay. is insanely yeah. high. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think we're getting to a million dollars unless it's going to take us a decade to get to a million dollars. Yeah, right? I, I, I would concur that a lot of you know, I, it's going to take a long time. Yeah, I, people, people forget that this stuff, even though this ETF stuff is great, and I'm. I, 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 Look, it, it's been a long road. <laughs> you, know, it, you, you go back to 2016 and I, look, you're, you're talking about, use the word a lifetime ago, right? Yeah. And I Absolutely. think it's going to be another lifetime before we get to a million dollars. You know, I just, well, I think every push and every bull run has a central theme to it. I think to your point, the last central theme was ICOs. Mm -hmm. Uh that, that was the newest term. Everybody was throwing it out from every rooftop. And that, in my opinion, allowed um, retail investors to get excited about this technology in a way they hadn't. I think Ethereum, to its credit, um, I think there's lots of things wrong with Ethereum. I think it wasn't fairly and equitably distributed, which is my first big problem with it. Um, but I do think that smart contracts are, are here to stay, right? I, I, I don't think they're going anywhere. And I do encourage us to find in, in what I would call the Bitcoin of smart contracts, which I don't think we have right now. <laughs> I think we're right on the edge and there's a few pieces of tech that I think very highly of in that regard, but Solana is not one of them. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the next bull run or this bull run. Well, you forgot, you forgot one bull run, which is the 2020, 2021 bull run, right? And I feel like that one really kind of like the, the theme that I kept on hearing in 2020 was DeFi, right? It was. You know, so it, it really sort of feels like, again, not a Bitcoin. You know, you did have Sailor talking about, you know, the greatness of Bitcoin. And, and honestly, if he wasn't there, I don't even think, I think he might have contributed 2x to the Bitcoin price just himself, right? Well, he was he you should have seen. I don't know if you were there or not, but when he spoke on stage in 2021 um, at the Bitcoin conference, it, yeah, he was the only guy that didn't dabble in anything other than Bitcoin. Everybody right. else would would hedge their bets on stage about talking about oh, yeah. Ethereum. And, and he was the only guy going, no, nope, this is this is the only protocol that that's worth putting your money into. I and remember so, that. Yeah, he, he's a. Uh, He's an he's an interesting guy. He's he's put his money where his mouth is, and you've got to respect. You know what does it say? The 
the world favors the bold or the future favors the bold. Um, yeah. Fortune yeah. favors the Fortune's bold. Fortune favors the bold. Yeah. So uh, and Matt Damon fin- famously said that right before the market tanked <laughs> uh, on TV on the Super Bowl. Remember that? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that uh, he's. So, OK, so we have this new bull run. I think we're in a bull run. I think we can say we're in a bull run. And I think the new narrative for this bull run is ETFs. Right. I agree. You know, so. Well, I think it's I think it's more than ETFs. OK. I think it's new market makers. <laughs> Okay, new market. Good point. Yeah, I, I think you, any markets that exist, right, from pink mm-hmm. sheets to the S and P five hundred, mm-hmm. what's the difference between those two? The spread, the mm-hmm. market maker, the liquidity. Yeah. It's it, that's that's what every market is desiring. Someone who has a deep enough liquidity pool and the knowledge of how to manage that to keep the willing buyers and the willing sellers as close together as possible so that the most transactions can take. And I would argue the integrity of the market. maker. I would completely agree. But those in my mind go hand in hand. You can't get one without the other. And you, you get the tight spreads when you have the integrity. (laughs) Um, Right. But I mean, I think that, you know, I don't have any evidence of this, right. But, you know, Binance did a lot of, I won't say shady things, but you know, there's a lot of lot of evidence that they sold Bitcoin or that they may not have. Let's had. not go into Binance because it's somewhat speculative. What's FTX? Right. Look at what FTX. FTX. We know they were doing that, right? They right. So FTX right. is a great example of they sold Bitcoin that they didn't have. They sold customer Bitcoin. They just sold Bitcoin they made out of thin air. Uh, Bitcoin and everything else, right? So, yep. and, and you know, now the the guy doing that is behind bars, um, you know. Uh, but you know, there was some real criminal. There was criminal activity and just extremely unethical activity by a whole number of players that are involved in exchanges, right? So, what I think has happened, in my opinion, yeah, has happened with many many technologies in my lifetime. I remember I was sitting in the Jester dormitory at University of Texas in 1999, and Napster was the hottest thing going. I remember, yeah. I mean, people were just downloading catalogs of music off Napster. Mm-hmm. Well, they were the market maker. <laughs> Who do we have now as the market maker? iTunes, Apple, right. Amazon. Right. We, we, we traded for much better market makers. And That's a great... Really great point. We're now going from the Sam Bankman Freeds of the world, the CZs of the world, right, to BlackRock and Larry Fink. I mean, right. that's not a little upgrade in market maker. That's, that's a massive going upgrade. from the poorhouse to the penthouse in one one cycle. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's excellent point, and I think that makes a huge difference. And I think it's it's also just reputationally, right? If you're an investor, you're like your dad, right? You you know you you come from some some money, and uh, and do you want to get involved in something that's happening in China in some unregulated thing? Probably not. Do you want to get involved in something that has Larry Fink, BlackRock seal of approval? You're probably okay with it. You know what I mean? I I think a lot of people um, are when we're moving from a very narrow and deep holding hold hodlers community yeah. to a broad and shallow. And there's a right. lot more money in the broad and the shallow than the narrow and the deep. Right. Uh, and so I agree. You're, you're talking about um, the fundamental mentality of rich people versus poor people, poor mm-hmm. people see opportunity, rich people see risk. So if, if you have a lot of money, what is your hardest job? To keep it. (laughs) Right. You're not looking at making more. You're looking at keeping what you already have. Right. Right. And that's why Michael Saylor is such a big believer in Bitcoin, because keeping it is a lot harder with inflation than without inflation. Right. And so you're looking at this mindset shift and the the Larry Finks and the people that he's bringing into the market are not the same guys that are living in tents with 90% of their net worth in Bitcoin eating canned right. beans every night. It's the guys who go, all right, they, they won, put 
three percent of my net worth in Bitcoin in an ETF. Like that is the wide and 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 sh shallow, and that's where we're headed. And there's, there, I I look at um, the most encouraging thing I see in the Bitcoin market is the fact that. 90 plus percent of the supply is out. Right. I, I don't, the same market makers on the mining side of things right. have lost their power. The market makers on the exchange side of things have lost their power. So now we right. have real market makers without any influence from these rogues, right. you know, um, companies, they, they can't stop it. And so if you look at the amount of Bitcoin that is being produced by miners, yeah. and you look at the amount of demand that is being placed on Bitcoin every month, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure out where, where we're headed, right? Now, the question is, is will that demand continue? And that, in my opinion, is a bet on the market maker. I don't know, but I sure as heck think Larry Fink has a better, he, he can get more people in Bitcoin than Michael Saylor can. I think, look, at this point, it's all about adoption, right? It's just, it's just, you know, how many, how many of these people are going to give that three percent allocation over the next Bingo. 10 years? Well, I think that's that, that is right. that is the number, and actually, that's you know, just by having this discussion and getting our content out, that's kind of our our best shot at kind of influencing things. Is basically just explaining to people, look, at this point, we've we've gone through these kind of crazy cycles of you know, the pirate days, right? With, with like Sam Bankman fried the pirate days with Bitmain, the, you know, we still have a little bit of that on the stuff, but they can't, as you said, most of the, most of the hash rate, most of the Bitcoin's been mined. So their, their, their power is less than, right. than it was. Right. It doesn't matter so much, even if there's a new Craig Wright, you know, coming. Well, I, I just want the math to soak in for people. Yeah. We're four epochs into yeah. a 33 epoch cycle and we're 90% right. through the inflationary curve. Right. So we have, we've gone 10% through the epochs, but we've gone 90% right. through the capital distribution. 96%. That's what I mean. 90 plus yeah. percent. So you're, you're yeah. talking about the de-risking the network. Yeah. Well, we're at the lowest risk ever in the history. Right. of, and, of and we're at, and we're at a period where the government's printing more money than ever. Correct. Right? Yeah. You know, we, we like sort of the converse of that is Bitcoin is sort of maturing and stabilizing and becoming this kind of thing you can trust more that's getting more regulated and stuff. But then the government is just going berserk, right? The, the U.S. government, the European government, everybody is just printing money like it's just it went out of style right They're they are out. and listen history over humanity has shown us that no fiat currency lasts forever it's no. impossible i will say this though um the people that control the world finance yeah are, are are so far beyond what people give them credit for as it relates to their knowledge of the markets and how to pull one lever and have the output change mm -hmm. on the end of the production line. And I, I have um, seen, I'm 43 years old and I'm not old, but I'm not young. And I've seen cycles, even in the traditional economy that make me believe that we're not anywhere near failure rate. I think that they can, uh, I'll, uh, saying that I've heard before is the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Um, and so yeah, I, I don't predict a failure. So I, I don't, don't either, predict, yeah. I don't predict a systematic failure where we're going to, you know, the entire system's going to break down. I just, I sort of predict more malaise, you know, people bitching more houses are more unaffordable. Uh, until you know, I, we yeah, all die. I feel like that's more the, the well, until where we, we are. Die, and then it'll be status quo for the next generation. It's all relative yeah. to your experience, right? And so right. Yeah. <laughs> you, all of us are just uh, looking at the 70 years that we are here. Yeah. They're not yeah. looking at, you know, uh, right. what this looks like on a macro scale. Well, Tillman, uh, I, I want to just, before we go, and we have very little time, but I want to I just show, showcase, so tell, tell everybody where, 
where what you're doing, uh, and I, as something I uh, re, uh, just learned a little bit, uh, let me just share this. So you have a company, and it's not a plug or anything, and I'm not, you know, not a paid sponsor or anything, but uh, you have uh, a company. You're the CEO of this company, Arch Public, and just tell us what this does. And I notice you, you're on the Wolf of Wall Street here. Just give us a, like a one minute pitch on what, what, sure. what, uh, what Arch Public I, does. I, I love technology and I love okay. when technology gives you access to things you haven't had access before. Um, and so what we've built is user driven automation. So okay. um, it's completely controlled by the user. It's yep. software that they can input their um, variables into, and they can run regression analysis against those variables to see what the historical performance of those variables would have yielded. And then they can set those variables in the form of an automated strategy where that anytime the market hits the certain thresholds that are programmed in, it will execute the trade for you. So if you're talking about trying to, I'm a big believer in compounding. And I think right. that the more people understand about compounding, the more clear it becomes that the shorter you can you can limit the cycle to, right. the more power it has, right? If I go to a garage sale and I buy right. a Beanie Baby for $100 and I go flip it for $200, right. that's a 100% return, right? right. right. And right. it happened in one day. Well, if I could right. do that every day, it wouldn't take me very long to amass a very large amount of money. So my right. our premise is, is that Day trading has a place in everyone's portfolio or should, but day okay. trading has been very, very difficult to manage and really a full-time job until automation has started. So basically this is software that you, you control yourself. You just Correct. pay a, you just pay a fee and then it, but it's entirely your keys. You're, you're doing whatever you want. It's, it's all through trade station and, Correct. uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, and uh, hey guys, I want uh, I want to, I'll put in my Twitter thing on the thing. I'll put Andrews and Till, uh, Tillman's uh, Twitter. And uh, I just want to thank you again for that a great conversation, man. I it's love great, it. Great, great to meet you, and uh, I love the I love the stories from the back back in the day. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Th thanks, it. Tillman. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. How'd you feel like that went? You there?